And we're going to start with George Barclay. So George Bishop Barclay, uh, and the date there is 1685 through 1753. So as you can see, Barclay was really an 18th century philosopher. And Barclay is famous for a really odd idea called idealism. Now, as I mentioned in class, we want to differentiate Barclay's metaphysical idealism from um, political idealism. So when adults tell young people that they are such idealists, right? What that means is typically um, a young person who believes anything's possible, who believes in progress, who believes that change is possible if you just want it badly enough. Um, that's not what the metaphysical theory means. Uh, in idealism, uh, in metaphysical idealism, it's a very specific view, and that is that the most fundamental and important element in the nature of reality is mind or spirit. And typically in the modern sense, we refer to it as mind. So the, the view of metaphysical idealism is literally that the world consists only of perceiving minds and their ideas, that the world is only mind. You may have heard people say uh, or repeat the slogan before that reality is perception. And typically what they mean when they say that is, well, um, everything that you know is something that you've perceived, um, or maybe they're saying the platitude, uh, reality is perception, the idea that um, uh, what you perceive or what you think in your mind, you can just make that a reality. And so the way that you look at the world, your attitude is going to shape how you see the world. Maybe all of those things are true, okay? But when Barclay said reality is perception, he actually meant it. For Barclay, it was illogical, it was irrational, it made no sense to say that reality was anything other than perception. And Barclay's point was that you can't prove that there's an external world out there, right? Barclay is famously, and he's most important in philosophy for his denial of the existence of matter. Barclay says you can't prove that there are things outside of your perception, right? That um, this staircase uh, behind me, you can't prove that this actually exists uh, outside of your perception. All you can ever do is talk about it with respect to your perception of the staircase. You can't actually prove that were you not here perceiving it, that it would truly exist outside of your perceptions. Now, let me be clear about this. I teach you Barclay not because I'm trying to convince you uh, of any of his ideas. I know of not one single philosopher who agrees in, in the 21st century who still agrees with Barclay. Barclay's essential position is that all we can know or have access to are perceptions. And that when you point to something in the world, right, when you point to uh, this microphone right here in front of me, right, Barclay's point was all you can know or have access to about this microphone is the microphone as a mental representation. So this microphone is technically not an externally existing, objectively, uh, ontologically existent object that you can uh, fully know on its own terms. Rather, when you perceive this microphone, you are perceiving your own perception of it, which flips a lot of our notions uh, on their head. We tend to think that we are accurately perceiving uh, external objects and that we see them as they are. Barclay's radical move in philosophy is that he's the first He's, well, he's not the first person. Uh, th these ideas actually uh, go really far back in ancient um, uh, Eastern, Eastern Buddhist philosophy in India, people like uh, Nagarjuna and Vasubandhu. Regardless, in Western philosophy, Barclay is the first person to say that all we can know or have uh, access to about this uh, microphone is our perception of the microphone. We're experiencing our perception of it. We're not experiencing uh, the object in itself. And this is a term that I want to teach you in philosophy. When philosophers refer to objects outside of experience, um, they usually use the term things in themselves. Things in themselves refer to objects as they exist outside of your perception. And so naturally, and Barclay makes a good point here, when we see this microphone, we see it 
in and through our narrow subjectivity. We see our perception of it, our imperfect uh, uh, sense faculties are perceiving it, uh, our, our, our senses when I touch the microphone, when I see it, uh, and that sort of thing, um, when I feel it, it enters uh, into my mind as sense data. I'm never really experiencing the external object uh, itself. And so Buddhists refer to this as things from their own side. In Western philosophy, uh, we typically refer to this as things in themselves rather than your perception of things. Barclay didn't think that you could ever prove or talk about rationally things in themselves. The only thing that you could prove ev uh, exists is mind perception, sensation. He thought that the only thing that made sense to say logically and the only thing that you could definitively prove was that um, mind exists. Uh, kind of going back to that idea of Descartes, I think therefore I am. If you're thinking you know at least you have a mind and so therefore um, all you can really say is that mind exists. Uh, Barclay's kind of a monist, again going back to our study of the pre-Socratics. Monists believe that there's the world is made up of one fundamental stuff, right? Um, whereas Descartes said that the that the Descartes was a dualist, whereas Descartes posited that there are two fundamental kinds of substances. Mind, right, was one substance, and then of course matter, the physical stuff, was another substance. So your thoughts, memories, experiences, uh, perceptions, your dreams, your hopes, your goals, your desires, your feelings, your feelings of pain, those things are mind. They're not physical. You can't touch them. Um, and then, so that's one substance. And then another, another substance is that there are actual physical things out there in the world. Uh, there's matter. Your brain as an organ, for example, is matter. Uh, and then of course, Descartes thought that the two were connected uh, in and through the pineal gland, because of course the mind-body problem is the question of, okay, how can it be the case, right? that mind and matter aren't connected. They can't be totally separate su substances because when you have a thought, right? When you have an intention to do something, you can actually, your mind can actually tell your body to go do it. When you're sitting in class and you raise your hand and you decide, I'm going to ask Mr. Hill, can I go to the bathroom? You decide to do it. You're gonna risk it. You're gonna raise your hand and say, Mr. Hill, can I go to the bathroom? You had a thought you decided to raise your hand, then you did will your body to raise your hand. So our mind and our bodies, our minds can essentially push our bodies around, right? Uh, it kind of goes back to this idea of the stuff of thought, right? So um, uh, that we can actually move matter around uh, because of the ideas that we have. Whole wars are started um, uh, because of the ideas that we have. And of course, Descartes was looking to find a solution to the mind-body problem. And he was trying to figure out, well, when I think something and then I go do something, or when I think something and then uh, and then get anxiety and have physical manifestations of uh, my th thought processes, that proves that there's some kind of link between mind and body, uh, between mind and matter. Uh, the modern view is that the physical brain, the actual organ, the body part, the, the, the matter brain, gives rise to the phenomena that we call mind. Uh, Descartes didn't think that was the case. Descartes believed that God uh, created two separate types of substances and that uh, with God's help, those two things interact in and through the pineal gland. And that's why they call him a substance dualist uh, versus a property dualist. If you remember from our earlier unit, a property dualist is someone who believes that mind supervenes on matter such that you can't have mental states until you have certain brain states. Here's a little uh, image of this. And of course, here you have the perceiver, right? We tend to think that we're experiencing the object itself. But what uh, Barclay wants to say is that we're actually perceiving our perception of the object, right? So this candle as a thing in itself or as a thing from its own side, well, that's going to be eternally closed to us. We are only go ever going to be able to experience our perception of the thing. And probably this is um, not too controversial of a point here is that we all kind of know it's impossible to experience something outside of our perception. What would that even mean? Um, Barclay though, the, the reason that not many people are 
hard metaphysical idealists in the Barclayan sense is that it entails some pretty radical um, uh, claims. Uh, if you actually believe what Barclay's saying, um, there are some consequences to that that we're pretty much not comfortable with or um, not willing to accept. And I understand that completely. I'm not an idealist. Um, but again, if you believe what Barclay's saying, and if you take it seriously, and if that's what your metaphysical model is going to be, if, you, if this is what your theory of reality, your theory of epistemology is going to be, you have to say, strictly speaking, the world is constructed purely of thought. Material objects only exist in and through being perceived, right? So this is his argument broken down in a clear and concise fashion. All knowledge comes from perception. What we perceive are ideas, not things in themselves. A thing in itself must lie outside of experience. So the world consists only of ideas and minds that perceive those ideas. A thing only exists insofar as it perceives or is perceived. And so here's another diagram of that. And uh, of course, the thing exists. Reality is that thought that you have of the tree or the perception that you have of the tree. Um, and um, reality is not the tree itself. Um, and people really aren't willing to accept this, but here's a quote from Barclay. Idealism refers to efforts to account for all objects in nature and experience as representations of the mind, and sometimes to assign to such representations a higher order of existence. It is opposed to materialism. In modern times, idealism has come largely to refer to the source of ideas to man's consciousness, whereas in the earlier period, ideas were assigned a reality outside and independent of man's existence. Uh, and so that is a quotation there from, it's actually not from Barclay, it is probably from Bertrand Russell's uh, History of Western Philosophy. I'm not sure where that quote comes from, uh, something I put in there years ago. Uh, nevertheless, that's right. So um, what I want to say is uh, the reason that people have a, have a tough time with this is that it leads to a position that philosophers call solipsism. The reason that people don't find idealism um, workable or usable as a, as a metaphysical model is that it leads to the idea that things exist for you, that you can really only prove that you exist and you can only prove that things out there in the world exist insofar as you perceive them. So it leads to this solipsistic view uh, in which, you know, we're basing our conception of reality on the idea that um, we live in this sort of Truman Show world where everything is put here for us. They don't exist until we perceive them. It leads to a kind of narcissism. It leads to a kind of um, egoistic, um, uh, the, the, the world, so to speak, depends on you perceiving it and wouldn't otherwise. It's difficult with Barclay's um, uh, philosophical model to say that, um, to say that um, the world existed before you were here. Uh, how could you prove it? Um, uh, and any attempt to do so wouldn't be full proof. Uh, when objections were leveled against him, like, uh, for example, wait a minute, are you saying that a tree would cease to exist if no one was looking at it? What Barclay would then do is he would reply that, because uh, he knew that was nonsense, he would reply that God always perceives everything. If there, if there were no God, what we take to be material objects would have, would, would just suddenly leap into being when we look at them. So Barclay's claim truly was the, the odd idea that when you ask him, well, hold on a second, where do these perceptions come from? If there aren't things out in, in the world that I'm perceiving, then why am I perceiving anything at all? Barclay's answer is that God puts them there. Um, so, uh, and then, of course, the most common objection to Barclay's philosophy is captured by Bertrand Russell in his book, A History of Western Philosophy. Russell writes that, quote, common sense and traditional physics make it clear that there are, in addition to my own experiences and other people's, also events which no one experiences. For example, the furniture of my bedroom while I'm asleep and it's pitch dark. G.E. Moore once accused idealists of holding that trains only cannot see the wheels while they remain in the station. 
Common sense refuses to believe that the wheels suddenly spring into being whenever you look, but do not bother to exist when no one is inspecting them. So the idea that, um, well, you've never seen Pluto with your own eyes, therefore it doesn't exist. Um, you know, if aliens had visited the uh, uh, the uh, Milky Way galaxy and then our solar system before humans ever existed, um, Earth didn't exist for them. Like they wouldn't have they wouldn't have encountered the fact that Earth is the third planet from the sun. Barclay says no. So you might be familiar with this um, f uh, fun philosophical sort of. Um, uh, question of if a tree falls in a forest and no one's around to hear it, does it actually fall? Unfortunately, the answer for Barclay is going to be uh, yes, uh, no, no. Um, the tree does not actually fall. Um, if no one's around to perceive it, there's no way in which you can logically say that the tree existed or even fell. Um, so again, Barclay would then go to, well, God always uh, perceives everything. And um, so if it does exist, God is perceiving it uh, and therefore it can be there in the sense that it's there as a representation of God's perception. But unfortunately for science, that's not going to be uh, quite good enough uh, because science is all about um, understanding uh, the world as it exists outside of our perception uh, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, for example, if you can't see atoms, according to Barclay, the atoms don't exist, right? There are all sorts of questions that don't really make sense from a modern scientific perspective with Barclay, right? And you're going to see that Barclay's ideas are updated, okay, when we get to um, when we get to the philosophy of empiricism. Empiricism really improves on a lot of Barclay's ideas. It kind of um, it kind of um, I mean, there's empiricism for Barclay, but after Barclay, um, uh, Barclay raises a lot of good questions and empiricism is able to refine itself and give us a better uh, understanding of the way the world works. And then of course, Kant comes along after that and blows both out of the water and really synthesizes rationalism and empiricism and gives his own philosophy uh, called transcendental idealism. So we're gonna stop there and um, stay tuned for the next one.